on today's World Insight. G7 nations in a virtual meeting to take up global security concerns with Afghanistan a hot topic, threats of Taliban sanctions and a looming deadline for full withdrawal. What's on the agenda? And a Chinese military strategist pulls no punches in explaining why China looks forward to being in step with Afghanistan after the hasty retreat of U.S. and allied forces. China is one of the largest trade partners of Afghanistan. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight, coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Tian Wei. We begin today's program with the latest in Afghanistan. The G7 is holding an emergency virtual meeting on Tuesday to discuss ongoing challenges in Afghanistan. The word ahead of the meeting is the G7 will discuss whether to impose sanctions or officially recognize the Taliban to encourage an inclusive government. A decision also has to be made whether the U.S. will heed appeals from allies to delay the August 31st deadline of a full withdrawal of forces. The Taliban warns of consequences if the U.S. delays complete withdrawal. The Guardian called the G7 meeting a gathering of vanquished, highlighting disappointment in the messy drawdown of allied forces. Meanwhile, reports confirmed CIA Director William Burns met Taliban leader Abdul Baradar in Kabul. What do all these developments mean? Let's loop in our panelists. Now, we are joined by a panel on the G7 meeting on Afghanistan. In Chapel Hill, U.S., Klaus Laris, a distinguished professor of history and Hello. international affairs from University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He's originally coming from Germany. In Washington, D.C., Brian Becker, executive director of the Answer Coalition. Last but not least in Beijing, China, Yang Xiyu, senior research fellow from the China Institute of International Studies. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. As we speak, things are evolving in a dramatic speed. Uh, the latest is about the CIA director meeting with the uh, political leader of the Taliban. Now, uh, Professor Laris, your quick response to the latest. Yeah, that was quite surprising that the CIA director has met with the Taliban leader, one of its leaders, but it clearly is an attempt by the Biden Association to find out whether the Taliban would be open to a slight extension of the deadline of bringing the uh, refugees home, like a few days or maybe a week. Um, we don't know the result of that conversation yet, but I'm sure we will find out soon. And as has been said before, uh, Biden at the moment is squeezed between the allies and the Taliban. The yeah. allies want an extension, and apparently the Taliban don't want to give that extension. About the CIA director's meeting with the uh, political leader and the, one of the chief negotiators in Qatar, actually, it is according to the Washington Post the report. We have not yet confirmed. At this moment, we are talking uh, by the official sides from both sides about this meeting. We'll see how things would evolve. Having said that, though, let me jump directly into some of the issues related to G7. Mr. Becker, we see a division among the G7 about the deadline of withdrawal, about the U.S. chaotic, quote-unquote, handling of the withdrawal, and about whether the U.S. leadership is the right one uh, since uh, uh, the agreement in Doha was reached, uh, Mr. Becker. Yeah, this is a major embarrassment for the United States uh, writ large. It's also, of course, a big embarrassment for the Biden administration. When the United States used uh, the article in NATO triggering an, a NATO response to the September 11th attack, all of the NATO partners agreed to participate in the invasion and then occupation of Afghanistan. But it was the United States unilaterally that uh, decided that by 
September 11th, the U.S. was going to pull out and that the United States anticipated that Kabul could fall perhaps in 18 months or mm -hmm. maybe 90 days. But Joe Biden proceeded unilaterally, announced the withdrawal, said it was happening, confirmed that it was happening. And then as the government army fell apart, imploded, uh, the allies who were part of the occupation for 20 years uh, were left standing. I mean, the United States said, yes, we're leaving, but British troops are also there. British soldiers have also died there. And so, of course, Boris Johnson convened this emergency meeting because while Joe Biden said the U.S. is leaving definitely by August 31st, mm -hmm. the U.K. has not agreed to leave by August 31st. The U.K. official position is that they're not leaving until British uh, citizens are evacuated. Right. So there's, a, there's an extreme tension uh, between the allies in NATO as a consequence of the U.S. handling of its exit from Afghanistan. As the four of us are discussing here, we are not yet uh, having the confirmed information about the conclusion of the G7 virtual meeting on Afghanistan yet. But, uh, Mr. Young, many of the topics likely to be discussed we know very well. Mm -hmm. Now, some of the divides earlier mentioned by our panelists uh, do you see there is any hope of a solution? Well, no. Uh, actually, b uh, both for Biden and the uh, American allies have a, a very difficult situation, uh, and they are all of the allies, uh, Western countries now in very difficult position. Uh, not only because of the different concerns and the worries between U.S. and its allies, but also the different position, be uh, different requests between Tal from Taliban and the uh, allied uh, states like uh, UK. And the contradiction request from UK and the Taliban yeah. really make the US in a really difficult position. And the un uh, answer remain uh, uh, unclear. However, besides the deadline of uh, uh, withdrawal, another more fundamental, more substantive issue is how Biden administration should set the new position towards okay. the upcoming Taliban uh, regime after after fighting against them right. for 20 That's years. That's another issue we really want to handle. That is the, you know, the attitude of the G7 as a whole toward uh, the, the Taliban regime, likely. Uh, but but let's talk about the division within the G7 itself. Uh, Professor Larry, do you see there is a hope with this meeting that things can be resolved to a certain extent? Internally, I think they will be at each other's throats and will really have uh, been very uh, displeased with each other. To the outside world, they probably will try to present a united front after this meeting and say they all have agreed on a certain point of view. But I think this is just for the outside world. Internally, yeah. they are very, very divided. And it is pretty clear that the Biden administration has proven to be, at least in this issue, quite incompetent, cannot res um, manage the withdrawal in an orderly fashion. And of course, uh, the allies have concluded that that sudden withdrawal was much too abrupt. And also the Biden administration decided to withdraw its military first, like at Bagram Air Base, mm -hmm. rather than look after the civilian evacuees. And this is, of course, not the way to do it. It should be the other way around. And the Allies know that, Biden knows that, and they will be really deeply divided. But to the outside world, they will try to present a united front, I'm, I'm sure. There are two other points we really need to mention here. One is that the Biden administration, President Biden himself, in a recent speech to the American people, he talked about the goals of American troops there. It's not about rebuilding Afghanistan. It's not about building a local democracies. Uh, however, I really wonder when he said that, whether he's really representing his colleagues of other G7 nations who, for, for, for example, Germany have been vowing to try to uh, contribute to the rebuilding of Afghanistan for years. So uh, it seems that uh, uh, there is a, a huge uh, difference now, even about the goals of the mission after the mission was almost uh, quote unquote complete. Mr. Laris, very briefly. Yes. 
I agree with that. I mean, nation building has become a bad word in the United States, but it is obvious if you go into a country, you occupy that country for 20 years, what are you supposed to do mm. but to build that nation and to turn that nation into a constructive, civilian-run uh, government which actually looks after its people where human rights are uh, uh, observed and these kind of things. And so I think it is just a slogan for the American public who somehow dislike being involved in foreign countries mm. and do some uh, uh, nation building work. But everyone knows that of course if you occupy a country for 20 years, nation building is the goal. Right. And the, the Western allies will not give on, uh, up on that. They will put humanitarian aid into Afghanistan, they will put developmental aid into Afghanistan even uh, once the Taliban have taken over properly and hope that the civilian society which has developed well, at least to some extent in Afghanistan over the last 20 years that that will be maintained to we'll some extent. We'll have to see because there are enormous amount of humanitarian crisis that's already going on Mr. Becker. I guess we need to really discuss something about that particularly the internally displaced person and also the huge amount of African uh, the Afghanistan refugees going to the other countries but the United States. Right. I mean, there's a there's obviously going to be a, a refugee crisis. Uh, when you think back about the 20 years, I mean, when you really think back about it, the Taliban government was dispersed in October 2001. In November 2001, people don't know this, the Taliban offered to surrender. And Donald Rumsfeld arrogantly said, no, we don't negotiate a surrender. All the Taliban wanted at that time was amnesty. So here we are 20 years later, the U.S. dropped 15,000 bombs on Afghanistan in the last two years. Yeah. A quarter million Afghans are dead, 71,000 are civilians. And now the U.S. government leaves in a panic after 20 years. And of course, all of the, those in Afghan society who allied themselves with the United States feel at risk. And so everything has been based on American arrogance and the inability to actually have an understanding of what's best for the Afghan people or the Afghan society. Again, every miscalculation that could have been made has been made. And the U.S. generals knew for the last eight years that this was a lost cause, mm -hmm. but no political leader has taken responsibility for it. Right. Now Biden has, and he's getting all of the recriminations domestically and internationally. But frankly, the American people, and this goes to who Biden was speaking to, they're so sick of the Afghan war or the Iraq war or endless war that Biden's program and his credibility, I don't right. think is that strained at home. Of course, uh, you can judge uh, from the tone of Mr. Becker, President Biden in the administration facing tremendous political pressure as a result of this latest uh, chaotic uh, exit from Afghanistan. Having said that though, Mr. Young, there are a lot of other issues that's between the G7. Hopefully they can present a united picture with the other issues. For example, whether to recognize the Taliban regime or not. As we know that it, a quote unquote government is now being formed, uh, consultation is in process. We do not know the nature of that consultation, how fair is that consultation, but we do know from the spokesperson of the Taliban that I talked to earlier that it is ongoing. So Mr. Young, uh, whether that regime will be recognized by the G7? Well, not only in my observation, not only G7 uh, countries, but also most of the countries in the international community now are waiting and are seeing what Taliban, uh, the upcoming government, uh, will do, how they can implement what they have committed. And if they commit uh, if they implement what they have committed, I think it, it, it won't be uh, difficult, uh, it won't be a rocky road towards the uh, recognition by the majority of uh, international community. Regardless. But I know that the promise, Mr. Young, once you are making the promise, the implementation could take years to see yeah. the final results. So, but the, there is a dilemma whether to recognize that regime now or not, because you have to deal with someone inside Afghanistan. Who is that going to be, right? So I think that there is an immediate question that needs to be answered right now, Mr. Young. Yeah, uh, that's the contradiction between 
policy uh, between what can policymaker can do and uh, what the reality can develop. Much. Theoretically, uh, it is indeed to make a decision of recognition in short time. But uh, uh, in reality, as you mentioned, right. all the commitments need, it will take time to implement all the True. commitments. But the key factor now facing all the related countries, especially the G7 uh, country is, uh, how to define the so-called inclusive government? Well, it's, there are a lot of adjectives there in that uh, promise, in the agreement signed yeah. between the United States and the Taliban, together with several other partners, many of them are G7 members, but how to translate the adjective into actions? Those are the most important questions, I guess, Mr. Yang. Yeah. Another thing, um, uh, Professor Laris, is about the leverage that the G7 has been talking about over the Taliban. Right now, many of the leverages could be included in several categories. One, sanctions or not. Two, recognition or not. Three, whether the money will be given uh, to the Taliban-led government, uh, those money that belonged to also the earlier government, the Republic of Afghanistan. So, uh, Mr. Laris, how do you see these leverages? How useful are they? I think the leverage right now is very, very limited. Maybe in the next few weeks when the withdrawal has been completed and the evacuee issue has also been resolved, maybe then leverage will increase a little regarding financial aid, humanitarian aid, World Bank loans to the Taliban. But right now I can hardly see any leverage whatsoever. Clearly the, ta the Taliban have the upper hand. They control the roads to the airport. They can say that the 31st of August will be the end. After that, there will be even military resistance. So the, the Allied powers really have to go to uh, the Taliban cap in hand and ask for a favor and ask and beg the Taliban whether or not they can stay for a few more days to fly out people. So that leverage which we just talked about, recognition, sanctions or not, and things like that, that may come into play in a few okay. weeks' time. It certainly isn't the case right now. And sanctions, just one word about sanctions. Of course, we know there might be a food crisis, a severe humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan by September, some UN organizations have predicted. That is not the time mm -hmm. to impose sanctions on Afghanistan, and the, the international community wouldn't tolerate that. So I think, as I said before, leverage is very limited indeed. I see. At the same time, China seeks a more constructive approach to Taliban-ruled Afghanistan. That is, according to the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson today, Wang Wenbin told reporters on Tuesday. The international community, he said, should encourage and promote the development of the situation in Afghanistan in a positive direction. Imposing sanctions and pressure at every turn cannot solve the problem and will only be counterproductive. We should not repeat the tragedy after one certain country made a mistake. Now Afghanistan and the entire international community, especially countries in the region, have to pay for it. End of quote. That is according to the Chinese spokesperson of the Chinese Foreign Ministry, Mr. Yang. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, uh, firstly, uh, as always, China never believed sanction as a policy tool can be workable, can be effective. In fact, it's hard to find any successful case indicating sanction works. Mm. Uh, so now that uh, Afghanistan has fallen a very complicated situation, I think any kind of sanctions on Afghanistan will uh, be only contribute to a negative results rather than constructive results. That is why at the very beginning, okay. uh, China has uh, expressed the opposition about uh, any sanction uh, consideration. Mr. Becker, what about sanctions? What about the money that it might be uh, used as a leverage? And what about the recognition, all of these tools, quote unquote? Sanctions are a, a form of war imposed powerful on those who are weaker. Mm -hmm. The United States is never sanctioned, for instance, or the UK, no matter what its conduct. But big countries, powerful countries, uh, can sanction poorer countries. And so I think sanctions are an unconscionable uh, act of war. It deprives the 
civilian population, food and medicine, and that which people need to live. The U.S. imposes sanctions and seizes assets of countries like Venezuela or Cuba uh, I, or Iran. I think it should stop. I, I, think, I think the United States has to recognize the reality that the United States government is no longer the power in Afghanistan. There's a new government that's coming into existence. Mm -hmm. It will be dominated by the Taliban. There may be other political parties that are included. That would be the issue of inclusiveness. We don't know yet. But the United States, if anything, should pay reparations to Afghanistan. It has not been a benign mission. When the U.S. drops 70 or 80,000 bombs and missiles on a country in the name of nation building or stopping terrorism, that's performing terrorism. I mean, drone attacks, constant assaults against Afghan villages. The Afghan people, whether they like or hate the Taliban, they don't want to live under foreign occupation. And for me, as an American, uh, I insist that the United States recognize the government of Afghanistan and have normal relations rather okay. than use economic, diplomatic, or military tools uh, to undermine other people in other countries. I, I think see. that's the way forward. Right. We've been discussing a lot. There are many other issues that we haven't got the chance to discuss. For example, the fight against terrorism in that region, how Afghanistan will now be used as a harbor of terrorism and terrorist organizations. A lot of questions to be asked and answered. But for now, I want to thank the three of you joining us. Klaus Lowry, Brian Becker, Yang Shiyu. Gentlemen, thank you.